And our first speaker this morning, who seems to be shaking, <laughs> that's how anxious making you all are, is Peter Brindley, who's a critical care physician, AKA intensive care physician for those of you that live uh, on the other side of the pond or down in the southern hemisphere. He tells me he's also professor of, let me get this right, critical care, anesthesiology, and medical ethics. And his one claim to fame is he has two feral kids who don't care a damn about his titles. So on that note, Peter, you're going to talk about heroism or safety or both. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. What a terrifying, terrifying experience this is in front of all of you. Uh, I believe in situational learning, so I too decided to get drunk with you lot last night. And so if I'm shouting, it's hurting my head as much as it is yours. Uh, the original remit I was given was the rise of safety, big S safety, the organization safety, the end of heroism. And I thought, hang on a sec, nothing's that black and white. Let's try and flesh this out a bit. So uh, there's always got to be a Shakespearean quote. There's always got to be a Churchillian quote. You get to this point in the conference and basically we're still confused, but at a much higher level. Everything's been said, but not everything's been said by everyone. And so I'm going to try and crack on and tease apart some of these ideas. Now, you will hear from far better, more eminent speakers than myself. I am most definitely the Nigel Staplables on this panel today. But there was a fabulous talk given on Tuesday, and I'm going to try and bring in as many of the talks as I attended as I can, suggesting that we need to embrace religion. Well, whether we do, whether we don't, welcome to my religion, guys. My religion, my faith, the thing that allows me to sit at the front with far more eminent published people is my sense of comfort. In other words, once you stop looking at p-values, well, not stop looking at them, but look at more than just p-values, and you realize human factors, non-technical skills actually make the biggest difference, the world becomes a much more comfortable place. You feel much more comfortable when somebody says, is a lactate a good determinant of whether the patient's sick? You reframe it and you say, no, the lactate's a determinant of how quickly I need to get to the bedside. Is dobutamine a good drug? Well, it's a good drug if I have a team that knows how to use it and a team that knows when not to use it. In other words, once you start looking at things from a patient safety team factors point of view, it makes more sense. And I'm going to argue that that's your strongest drug. And like every drug, it should be used in the right dose, in the right place, at the right time. With that rather laborious introduction, why? Because it isn't heroes or safety, it is understanding the complex system we work in. This is Professor Julian Bean. The definition of a physician is a, is a healthcare worker authorized to work outside of guidelines. Now there's a lot in there. In other words, not authorized to do whatever they damn well please, and therefore you better understand with other healthcare workers who don't get that much leeway, part of your job becomes using your verbal dexterity to explain, guys, I know we typically do this, but we're not, and this is the reason, and these are our fail safes. The flip side of that is the person who isn't authorized to work outside of guidelines shouldn't lose their intestinal lining when somebody does, and shouldn't disengage and refuse to work in that team. So Julian Bean deserves a big smack t-shirt because he would understand what we're talking about today. The other thing is the healthcare system we work in needs to be understood more in the social context that we work in. I mean, for goodness sake, look at our hospitals. They're built like churches now. Look at our hospitals. They don't just offer you the absence of pathology. They offer you this and satisfaction and empathy and us state of well-being. And so Pellegrino, who is the ethicist that wrote medicine was the most humane of the sciences, the most scientific of the humanities, he would have got smack as well. This is Canadian data. I thought this was important to put this up because Canadians, we can all be a bit smug, right? This is the cold hard truth. And there's all sorts of mitigating reasons why medicine isn't the same as aviation. That talk has been done. But the point is the Canadian data is the same as the American data, it's the UK data, because these are not medical errors so much, these are humans making traditional errors in a medical setting where the stakes are high. And so one slide, 
the KLM flight that most of you have been bored to death with by some lecturer, completely preventable, that was the conclusion, the team failed to take time to become a team. Same for us. The problem is though, I hope there are no Glaswegians in the audience, uh, I went looking for a slide when I had to give a talk on the shortcomings of uh, Glasgow and I wrote problems with Glasgow and up came this slide. The point is, there are a lot of things that we've neglected and so far it's easier for us to talk about technology and drugs than it is to talk about human factors. It is our deep, dark, ugly secret that we haven't addressed this appropriately yet. Our gap, we're off to Dublin next time. I realize this is London, aren't they the same thing? I just thought I'd say that. Uh, our gaps are, we have a care gap. This distance, this gulf between what's optimal and what's typical. This expectation gap between what our families think they're coming in for and the things they're getting. And certainly an education gap. The things we prepare people for and the things that they actually do. And this, I think, is where safety is going to come from, more than checklists. This is where I think heroes will come from, knowing to make sure we're fit for task and we address this. And if I may just quickly address the checklist thing, I'm not here to say checklists are in league with the devil. I'm also not here to say the opposite. I would point out though that the best checklists have been looked at by human factors engineers. The best checklists on a single engine plane, which is a far better parallel for what you and I do than flying a 380, are about six items long at most. And the first item says never forget to fly the plane. The other thing is the best checklist force you to answer a question. It isn't just tick magnesium, it's what are you gonna do about their delirium today? What are you gonna do about their sedation? I think what we should argue is we're in the business, we smackites are in the business of managing complexity. There might be somebody in the hospital that can put in a tube better than you, put in a line better than you, our job is to manage complexity. Why? Because in the intensive care unit, at least, the belief is about 180 steps per patient per day. Probably the last aviation example, the B-17 bomber when it crashed in front of all of the brass, somebody beautifully commented, lamented even, too much plane for one man to fly. That's the same as our medical system. So science of managing complexity and the science of team performance. Work out of the Institute of Health Improvement, when there's one step, a single human being, 0.95 probability of getting it right, 100 steps, 94% chance of making an error. How many patients? Oh, sorry, how many steps per patient per day? That's right, 180. The whole patient safety thing starts to make a bit more sense. It's not lazy people who don't give a damn, haven't brought their A-game to work. It's a very complex system. Now, there's all sorts of complexity theory out there, but let's just give the Coles notes. There are simple tasks, complicated tasks, and complex tasks. And for the parents in the audience, the mums, let's be honest, we're just along for the ride, us dads. But for the mums in the audience, raising a child is seen as more complex than flying to the moon. Because the computers used to fly to the moon are nothing compared to what you all have in your pockets right now. So once you start saying, is this fit for task, at least we're getting somewhere. Is this checklist for us or is it for the patients? Is it for efficiency or is it safety? Start asking some difficult questions. The other thing is medicine is an art, absolutely. That busy day in the emergency room, the ability to get somebody admitted, that's an art. Is it science? I hope this conference has shown it is. But it's also engineering. We are process engineers for our hospital systems. Why? Because engineering knows you build a system that's reliable, not lucky, and resilient, not just good today. So they have standard operating procedures and they have fail-safes, and you should respect those. So the unnecessary consult to the emergency room is not an excuse for me to go off the handle at the emergency dock. It's to say, well, this is a fail-safe, what can I add? Engineering understands that knowledge exceeds the individual. In the early days, craftsmen, only I can build this chair. Then guilds, only we gentlemen, and it was gentlemen, can build those chairs. And now it's predictable process engineering skills of input, throughput, 
an output, the simplest engineering model. Well, what's ours? Admission, treatment, discharge. And we spend all sorts of time looking at the middle part, the treatment. And recently, attention was put to the, pr the afferent limb, the admission part. Now, I think, much like gynecologists and neurologists, we need to focus more on discharge. Oh. <laughs> Human factors, team training. <clears throat> it, it isn't just a byline in engineering, it matters. An engineering pressure tests the system. That's where simulation comes in. So, human factors matter. However, the wisdom of the ages matters too. This is the Janus head, the Janus head, the two-headed Roman god that says all kinds of things. It says you look back to the best of the past and you look forward to the best. And that's supposedly where the word January comes from, by the way. However... It also means your strength is your weakness. Not just you have strengths and weaknesses, guys, but your strength is your weakness. So you're darn good in a crisis situation. How good are you consoling a family? Probably not as good. You're so good at your science because you have this logical, linear brain. So when do you snap? When do you lose it? When somebody says something to you that just doesn't pass a logical sniff test. And this is what we should be looking at. And this is where the hero is the person who's able to say, pause, step one, step two, this doesn't make sense, but I'm not going to lose my cookies over this. Next, let's talk about some human factors. Personality, team, the A-team, and culture. It's required by Canadian law that you always have a hockey pitcher in your slides. And by the way, Chicago, congratulations. Your Canadians beat the other Canadians. Well done. <laughs> well done, Saskatchewan, you won again. Um, this is Wayne Gretzky, famous for all kinds of things. He's famous, though, for skating to where the puck's going to be, not where the puck is. And Chris Hicks and others did a superb job during this session of talking about cognitive imagining, having worked through the crisis before you get there. I think that's what heroes will do. I think heroes will realize that you get called in to deal with a difficult airway, you turn off the stereo, and you think about that on the whole drive in. You get the consult, you think about it as you're going down in the elevator. We reintroduce those elevator thoughts. We fly ahead of the plane. We have a shared mental model, which again, smarter than people than me have talked about at this very conference. Communication and team planning is to give yourself advanced permission so that you're flying ahead of the plane. So you've given yourself permission for those few occasions where the surgical airway is needed because I do a lot of M&M reviews, and sadly, the surgical airway is going to get done, guys. It's just whether the patient's a corpse at the time. But also, you have to understand when you leave the checklist, the mighty checklist. So here is cognitive imagining. I got Ollie Flowers to strip off his shirt. I oiled him up. <laughs> that is the elite athlete planning that ski race before they do it. This is the surgeon doing the same. And there is increasing evidence that it helps. Interestingly enough, guys, it's not just that it helps imagine the difficult surgery, the difficult airway. It helps you imagine it's 2 o'clock in the morning. There'll be too few people in there. I need to identify an airway person, a breathing person, a circulation person. In other words, crisis management imagery makes a big difference. Hockey slide number two, because I really want to make my government proud. This is actually a Harry Truman slide. It's amazing how much you achieve when nobody cares who gets the credit, but you know, national champions and all, let's be honest. Let's talk a bit about teamwork. Well, why is it so difficult? Because we live in a Western culture that promotes the individual, and we all spent a number of years of medical school preparation besting our opponents, hiding their notes, and all such things, so that we would triumph as an individual. Maybe that was just me. And then we stick people in the library and we reinforce those behaviors. So teamwork's not innate. Teamwork needs to be practiced. You no more understand teamwork when you walk into an ICU and emerge than you do the inotropes and the receptors that they work at. But one is deliberately taught and one is assumed innate. So what do patients need? Well, they need a team that works for them. Let's hope this is going to work. Okay, 1950s, Indianapolis 500. Pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Do more himself changes the tires. Now I'm going to talk over this because this could be a 30-minute lecture. To work on the car. It's a tense time. 
Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. This is painfully, painfully slow, even though the video is flipping. That took two and a half minutes. 50, 1950. This. Nope. Well, I would, I would imagine that video really brought it home to you all, and you're all completely <laughs> clear now. I believe the line is, I wasn't born in Chicago, but I'm dying here. My point being, watch those two videos. Watch those two videos. 1950s, they didn't know what the hell they were doing. 2013, seamless. Now, if I had shown you a patient, black, blue, dying in the corner of neglect and nobody addressing them, and then shown the happy septic patient being discharged, you would have got it. Teamwork's the same thing. But... Teamwork's not enough. A team of experts is not an expert team. And you can read every pop psychology book you want, but we know that people will be obedient for the wrong reasons. The Milgram Electric Shock Therapy study, a beautiful example. Ashes from Conformity Study, where in fact, they could get, for example, a series of mathematics professors to line up, and the first three were told to say, when you asked uh, what two plus two is, uh, say it's uh, five. It's four, by the way. Uh, and then the last person they would ask him, and time and time again, that person would also give the wrong answer because he wanted to be part of the group. So just being in a team's not enough. The Zimbardo prison experiment, where prison guards, graduate students, turned into sadists, prisoners, graduate students, turned into unruly, difficult people. So we play a role. So it's not enough to say teamwork. You need to practice it, you need to model it. And there's fascinating work by Robin Dunbar about how you and I work in different sized groups. And there's a reason why military groups of nine and 30 and 150 have existed since the days of Sparta because we act differently and use different communication norms, different social norms, different grooming norms, depending on those groups. And you need to understand that. And then somebody's gonna say, aha, but what about this one? This man was a hero, wasn't he? Because he followed all the checklists. Well, he was a hero. Sully Sullenberg was also called Captain America, the Hudson River hero, le nouveau héros de l'Amérique. The point being, he signed in that day as the pilot not flying. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Imagine signing in in your emergency room as critical, or critical care unit as the doctor not doctoring, just watching other people. We're not there yet, are we? Now, the fascinating thing about Solomon Schellenberg is, yes, he coordinated everybody else. He didn't necessarily do it. He was the process engineer saying, you do that, good, you do that, good. The next part that's fascinating is he knew when the checklist was no longer fit for task and he got rid of it. And if you don't believe me, go back to those videos. They're definitely worth a watch. The other small point I would make is the one down in the bottom, which warrants half an hour's discussion. The evidence seems to show that fewer planes crash when the co-pilot's flying. Why? Probably because an ad hoc team has been performed, the surrogate is engaged, the, or so the subordinate, the team leader is not ashamed to speak up and corroborate and correct and collaborate. You form a team. We have trouble believing this stuff because look at the complexity that you and I as human animals can deal with. But guys, we're monkeys wearing shoes, okay? Here's our patient in the top left. Yes, very complex medicine that we do. But what we need to do is wrap that patient in a system. And the term that gets used is medical ergonomics. In other words, building a system like you build a chair that actually works for that individual patient. The problem is though, you've gotta be aware of your primitive side too, because this is the guy that kicks in when you get stressed or irrational or you name it. Let me give you an example. So ectopia, you will have a part of your hospital that you should rename ectopia. And what do I mean? Well, anesthetists, have two to three to four times the error rates that they do in the OR when called to do exactly the same thing elsewhere in the hospital. Why? The equipment's probably not available, the communication strategies are different, they're not well known. In other words, it's crisis management. 
So people have done clever work, all sorts of people have done clever work on the sort of dynamics of a resuscitation. And so let me show you a little bit. Anesthesia typically stands at the head of the bed. That's the position of power, that's the T in a game of squash when you're in the OR. But it's not once you're out the OR, so if you're going to run a code from the top, you gotta to announce. You've gotta say, I can't see this monitor, call out the sats every minute. The team leader typically stands at the right groin and the senior person walks in, is a meter off the bed at a 45 degree angle, usually eating a sandwich, and this has been studied. So what happens if the senior doesn't like what's going on? He or she moves to the end of the bed, grips the rail. We've all seen this. Now this should be communicating to the team leader, he or she doesn't like what I'm doing, I better up my game, or he's gonna get more involved. Because then the next step is, they come to the right groin, and then the next step is, they hip check them out of the way. And this has been shown time and time again. And so be aware, both if you're that team leader of the dynamic around you, and be aware as the chief not to come in and do this too soon. Attitudia, you've also got attitudia in your hospital. So we looked at a lot of airway errors at a certain hospital, great people. But there was an eMERGE doc there who had had an airway disaster. So we went to talk to them in a non-judgmental way and said, just out of interest, how come you didn't call for ICU backup or anesthesia backup? And they said, you know what, every time I call them, they come down here and they say, why are you calling me about every airway? This guy's fine, you're managing, they're too early. Or they come down and say, why the hell are you calling me now? Didn't you call me five minutes ago? There's blood pouring out his mouth, the too late thing. So she gave up on calling. But you know the interesting thing is, she said, they shouted at me, and so I'm not calling them again. And we said, and how long ago was that? She said, seven years ago. The point is it has a hangover. It has a cultural hangover. As doctors and nurses, we're fantastic at hitting the target and missing the point. That's how we got into medical school, nursing school. You gave us something to do, we did it. So you better give the right metrics. So read up on the Mid-Staffordshire Hospital Inquiry if you haven't heard it. It's an award-winning hospital that was doing atrocious things to patients, cutting corners to win awards. Read up on the Elaine Bromley Airway disaster where anesthetist after anesthetist just tried to put in a tube, put in a tube, put in a tube because they didn't trust their colleagues and nurse after nurse after nurse said nothing because they didn't think they were authorized to do so. So people say, is it humans or computers that are gonna lead the way? Well, it's the best of both, guys. Go back, read this book, Chess Does Philosophy. Fascinating book. Kasparov, I believe, won the first match against Deep Blue. Maybe it's the other way around, it doesn't matter. Deep Blue won a game, and one was good at pattern recognition, and one was good at not exhausting, and not getting emotional. What was fascinating was game two, was game three, four, five, where each team tried to mitigate the shortcomings of the other. Because instead what we do is this swinging of the pendulum. It's all about checklists, it's all about automation. Well, this shouldn't surprise anybody that after years and years of working on checklists and standardizing, the errors are now made because of over-reliance on computers. Again, guys, we're monkeys with shoes. We're looking for simple answers to complicated problems. So we do a little bit of teaching beyond checklists. This is how we force our people to work as a team. This is our surgeon, not focused on airway, breathing, circulation, but focused on running the team. But what became fascinating to us is how well the rest of the team worked, and they volunteered all sorts of information, like you may not have seen all of that blood's gone into the patient, you may not have seen the SATs are still in the 80s, what would you like me to do? Fascinating stuff. One of the final things I want to talk about are teachers, because are teachers heroes, or safety monitors, or what? So the very first thing you learn when you come into our ICU is how to intubate somebody. Ivan McGill described this in the 1930s as the sniffing position, something that would probably get you in trouble with the authorities nowadays if you went around sniffing excessively. My point is though, we decided to look and see if this actually worked, if it was fit for task. And so we asked a whole load of medical students and med medical residents, what does the sniffing position mean to you? And these were the range of answers that we got. These were the range of answers that we got. <laughs> My point is, stick them in the sniffing position, John, you'll have no trouble, I'll be in my office, is clearly not good enough. So we came up with an alternate 
the win with your chin. You were running across a closely contested race and you jut your chin out at the end. But we thought we'd better study it or else we were gonna be no better than McGill. So win with the chin is significantly better and it's actually got a little bit of evidence behind it. Or quaff the ale or sip the tea is better than sniff. But here's the fascinating part to me Sniffing the air actually made you worse. In other words, if I'd given no instructions, they would be better. And so I would just point out as educators, we have the power just like a drug to make people worse rather than better. Take some time guys and read up on culture. It truly matters. Why does it truly matter? Because we can throw all the data at all the conferences at you, but culture eats data for breakfast. So it matters and it can be taught, it can be studied. What matters most? Well, it's always C or the longest answer. So with less focus on putting tubes in, more focus on what comes out. So we did a curriculum based on this, what I think is a clever quote. Meant is not said, said is not heard. Heard is not understood and understood is not done. My point is guys, these human factors, this communication, this is gonna be the hero. It can make things better, it can be a placebo, it can make things worse, it can be a nocebo. Communication and team factors, that's the most dangerous procedure performed in any hospital. Kodak went out of business because they didn't know their core business. They thought they were in the business of taking photographs, they were actually in the business of saving memories. Our core business is communication, guys. It's teamwork, it's working together, it's not gonna be, should we do a lactate level, it's not gonna be with Ginotrope. It's gonna be, do we have a team that knows the difference between a sick patient, a patient somewhere in the middle, and a patient who's doing fine. Thank you so much for your time, really appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. Clearly he hasn't got situational awareness with time. <laughs> Natalie, do we have any snappy questions? I, I have, um, I've got a question from George Mastoris who asks how we can train an interprofessional teamwork and, and asks why medical school and nursing school still train us in silos rather than together. Uh, well, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. So you do need to work together in the very teams that deliver the care. You need to become familiar with each other. There's fascinating data that suggests why we have to prescribe communication in a dangerous situation. In other words, there's something called sterile cockpit communication or communication when a plane's below 10,000 feet that is very, very prescribed. You also need to provide time for that team to build, in other words, when they're not in crisis situations, social time together and other time together, where they're able to communicate in other ways so that they have the resilience as a team. Why do we still train in silos? You know what, we do all sorts of stuff in education because it's easier for us. It becomes an efficiency versus efficacy thing. So we teach people in big lecture halls like this because it's the easiest way to do it and the cheapest way to do it. It's not necessarily fit for task. So uh, there are scoring systems that you can use to look at people's communication and teamwork. Chris Hicks mentioned a number of them the other day and you can email me if you want some more. I just think those should be part of somebody's 360 evaluation. So measure their factual knowledge, measure their manual dexterity, but you can also measure their verbal dexterity and team dexterity too. It can be done. Thank you. Natalie? Uh, and Dean Burns asks how we can engage individuals who aren't used to working together in teams to work effectively in temporary teams. Yeah, it's a darn good point, isn't it? How do you deal with the reluctant? Well, well, that's your skill. I actually think that's your soft, hard skill at the bedside, is to identify these different personality types and sort of think, well, I've gotta manage the tasks of this resuscitation, but I've gotta manage the relationships of the team within it. In the UK, they do a course which I believe is called CRISP, terribly clever acronym, and it basically is about working with different personality types. And so this is something we simulate all the time, where we bring in somebody who's aggressive, where somebody's domineering. The interesting thing to me is, the toughest personality type to work with always seems to be the sort of passive aggressive blob in the middle of the room. The person who won't help you, won't hinder you, but just won't move out of the way. And, and this is probably synonymous with this sort of same idea of that blob that won't move out of the way otherwise. So I mean you appeal to somebody 
through a charm offensive and try and get them engaged. You try and show them the data and show them it's the biggest outcome for their uh, patient. But uh, you equally build a system that cares about people's personalities and gets past sort of saying, uh, you know what, he's a complete jerk, but boy, oh boy, does he publish some good papers. I mean, it's just not good enough for our system anymore. On that, on that <laughs> positive note, can we just give Kiro a round of applause for an excellent talk on teamwork?